Hello and welcome to the Forum for Access and Continuing Education's second uh, we webinar. FACE uh, is a UK-wide multi-sector network bringing together practitioners and researchers focusing on access, continuing education and lifelong learning. For more information about FACE, um, and also how to become a member. There's nothing like a shameless plug. Um, please do go to our website, which is www.face.ac.uk. One of the most important roles that FACE has is facilitating the exchange and dissemination of information and practice. And a fish out of water brings together a group of experts working within the careers and employability field to explore if we really are providing the relevant and suitable careers support to our widening participation students. Each presenter today will bring a perspective to the discussion and I have absolutely no doubt that you will generate some excellent questions from yourselves uh, following their presentations. As we've already said, uh, the question and answer box used to post all of your questions and please indicate whether it's a question direct to one of our presenters um, or an individual or, or a group um, a question. We're not going to post the questions uh, for public view until all of the presentations have finished. So please don't worry um, if you can't see your question um, initially. Uh, we will be posting them um, after all presentations have finished. Um, and finally, I would like to take this opportunity to really thank our presenters, uh, Jamie, Heather, Lardan and Tristram. You will have all have read their biographies, um, so I haven't done a, a lengthy uh, presentation around um, who they are because I'm pretty certain that you do know um, who they are. But I really do want to thank um, all of them. Um, it's been a really uh, wonderful experience um, working with you all. And I would also like to take this opportunity to thank Aga, um, our administrator for FACE, who has been um, an excellent support uh, during the preparation um, of this webinar. So I am now going to introduce our first presenter. Um, it's Dr Jamie Mackay um, and his title for his presentation is Why Local Enterprise Partnerships, LEPs for those that are not in England, and universities should fish together to support regional inclusive economic growth. Over to you, Jamie. Thanks very much, Deirdre. Uh, really good to, to be here today. Um, so I've, I've given myself just, just sort of five minutes just to kind of move through this because actually I think uh, what the other presenters got to say is a little bit more interesting in, uh, in what I've got to say. But um, I was keen to ensure that local enterprise partnerships were, were included um, in, the, in the presentation today um, and uh, really good to, to see we, we have got uh, one or two um, LEPs from around the country um, here. So those of you that don't know um, about local enterprise partnerships, there are around about 38 of them and 10 what can, combined authorities in England. Um, the business led partnerships between local authorities, um, local private sector businesses, but also sort of input from um, local government, um, third sector, education and training providers and, and LEPs play a really good sort of central role in determining local economic priorities, um, undertaking activities to drive economic growth and job creation, improve infrastructure and raise workforce skills within the, the local area. OK, so you know, why is that relevant to today? Well, skills are a really sort of key focus for all LEPs. If we're going to increase productivity, if we're going to encourage economic growth, um, skills are a key part of that in order to encourage um, productivity and, uh, and growth. We need to make sure that uh, our resident workforce are you know, skilled as highly as sort of possible. Um, 36 our LEPs have something called a skills advisory panel um, and this is something that's come from the Department for Education um, following industrial strategy from a, sort of a few years ago and the overarching aim from, from the, the DfE for, for these panels is for local skills provision to better meet labour market needs now and in the future. So really quite ambitious, but essentially what we're talking about there is employers 
uh, you know, and business coming together with education and training providers and sort of saying, you know, look, these are the skills needs that we've got right now, and these are what they're going to be in the future. How can we work with you to ensure that they are, are sort of met? You know, if, if businesses can have those those skills gaps, those skills needs met, then um, fantastic. Um, and just thinking about some of the uh, sort of young people that I know, uh, widening participation and outreach teams work with. Um, I just thought I'd mention a couple of reports that have been published over the last few years. So um, the City and Guilds, um, uh, Great Expectations report from a few years ago now, but also the Dream Jobs from the OECD published sort of um, earlier this year. And both of them have a, a very similar sort of interesting conclusion um, that uh, young people's career aspirations are, are quite narrow. Um, are not necessarily realistic of, of the labour markets, the, the, the economies that they are um, uh, sort of involved in. Um, and um, you know, with, there's definitely lots of work to be done to actually sort of help in, inform those, those aspirations, those ambitions. Um, and this is where LEPS and, and universities, you know, along with sort of colleges and other education training providers, can, can really work together. So, um, yes, thinking about some, some questions, how will my degree course help me get a great job? Um, you know, LEPS can uh, can really help work with sort of careers teams um, to help connect the dots to, to local careers and what's happening in, in local labour markets, what are the um, sort of patterns that change for, for the future. Um, what does the local graduate labour market look like? Um, and this is where, you know, LEPS can work with, let's say, sort of careers teams, but actually those careers employability teams can then work with the widening participation, the outreach, the recruitment teams to, you know, uh, um, focus on the key messages that they can then um, tell schools and colleges, you know, young people, but also sort of teachers and other sort of decision um, influencers, um, just to help sort of focus um, their minds about what's sort of going on in the, in the local area. And maybe sort of a bit further afield and then you know the, the local skills challenges so embedding careers and work experience opportunities into into the curriculum um i, I find with these sorts of of um of sessions it can be quite helpful to identify some some agendas you know so when if you're thinking about well actually this sounds really good but how can i make my senior managers how can i make the um, you know, the, the, the senior management team in an institution actually sort of pick up and, and think think about this. So here are some agendas that we're sort of talking about. Yes, access WP, business development, curriculum planning, employer engagement, uh, the graduate outcomes and, and sort of LEO, lifelong learning, research and innovation, social mobility, um, student recruitment, TEF and, and, and more. Um, so that's a, a say, just wanted to keep it to sort of five minutes. Um, there's sort of my contact details there. If you want to know more about the LEP network, find out who your local LEP is, um, go to lepnetwork.net um, and you can find out more about the skills advisory panels. Um, these slides are, are going to be shared afterwards. So you'll be able to sort of click on these as well. And that's it from me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jamie, um, and that was an excellent uh, start to uh, our webinar today, uh, giving some local uh, and national context. I'd like to now introduce our next presenter, um, Heather Pacero, um, who is exploring the amphibious student response to their university surroundings um, and ideas for environmental changes to how we better empower and welcome underrepresented groups into higher education. Heather works at the University of Southampton um, and I'm delighted to welcome her now here. Thank you Deirdre, I'm just checking you can hear me. Hello and welcome to this session on the theme of a fish out of water. The fish out of water theme is an idea that came from our first planning meeting for this event. And as we know, the fish out of water idiom describes a person away from their usual environment or activities. If you are a fish out of water, you feel awkward because you're in, in an unfamiliar situation or because the people you are with are very different from you. 
If we look at the university space and our original space as first generation students and graduates, we, can we easily map across our social experience, values, tastes and habits? The political scientist Ray Wolfinger said, the plural of anecdotes is data. All data is information surrendered. So here is some information surrendered to illuminate and gain an insight into the first generation student university experience of feeling like a fish out of water. From my own higher education career service unit funded 2016 research, when asked about her housing situation, one of our first generation participants told us the other three have very medical backgrounds, whereas I and the other person have a very working class background. We have very different attitudes towards money and living costs. Another first generation student told us there is just one other and me who are first generation and the other three come from very middle class backgrounds and you can feel in the house there is a difference. And a first generation student intern we employed as part of, a, of an um, accessibility audit told us, I think the fact we are expected to change whilst our most privileged peers can keep their culture legitimises and reinforces the idea that middle class culture is more valuable and acceptable than our backgrounds. So first generation students have this uncomfortable experience at university and perhaps the higher education space is not designed for them. But do these differences transpose to disadvantage in the graduate labour market? Here is a snapshot of the destination of leavers from higher education reporting over three years. And as we look at the UK university data sector at the top, I've highlighted in red and you will see that the gap between those who answered yes, my parents participated in higher education and those who answered no is consistent across all three years. And you will also see that there is a smaller gap between these two groups across Russell Group institutions and University of Southampton is in line with this, perhaps due to higher attainment, for example. And although the last Delhi data for this group at University of Southampton showed a slight fluctuation, the most recent graduate outcome survey indicates the previous trend. It's really important to take into account that if we remove programmes like medicine and the health sciences faculty, the gaps are much more pronounced. As you can see, the larger gaps at University of Southampton graduate destinations is the don't know group in line with the sector, although Russell Group performs better with just half the gap of University of Southampton. So how as an organisation can we intervene and adapt the careers and employability environment for first generation students with a view to improving their future chances? How can we empower those who are the first member of their family to attend university as they move towards the graduate labour market? Driven by the data revealing this disadvantage gap, in addition to insights from my research, um, we wrote a pro project plan and the research had indicated that first generation students find it difficult to envisage their career path ahead as they take a different path from their family networks and therefore have no insight into the road travelled and any barriers or opportunities they may encounter. At University of Southampton Careers and Employability Service, we developed the My Generation Career Coaching Pilot Project with 25 places for first generation students who applied. After the initial pilot stage, we're hoping to increase the student pool to include those who do not know if their parents participated in higher education. And the project launched in January 2019. At the start of the programme, we asked students to score their own career readiness. The career readiness is an online self-assessment in line with the graduate capital model learning outcomes originally developed by Dr Michael Tomlinson in our School of Education at University of Southampton. Tomlinson divides capitals as key resources that confer benefits and advantages in the labour market. Although we have a very small sample group of 25 for the first year pilot, we have tested the group to gain a guided insight into their graduate capitals. And indeed, after testing the 2020 My Generation students, the pattern has repeated the, the above um, in the picture, 19, 2019 picture. Through engaging and identifying their own strengths, barriers and areas for progress, My Generation students were able to take control of the career and as they look to the future. During the career readiness test, students are asked to score themselves on a scale of one to six to a set of statements relating to each one of the five graduate capitals. This then indicates their self-perceived career readiness. Comparing my generation responses to the other 700 undergraduates, 
who had taken the test revealed that my generation students scored themselves below the norm group in three of the five capitals, but close to level in social capital and marginally higher in psychological capital. My generation students notably scored themselves above the norm group in their responses to the below statements. I can be persistent despite setbacks. I consider myself to be adaptable. I can make plans and respond to change. And my generation students notably scored themselves at the top of the scale in responses to these statements. I feel confident. I can present myself well in the sector which interests me and I can identify what employers value most in graduates. My generation students scored themselves notably below the norm group in their response to this statement. I feel confident and can perform well at interview. And for this statement, I can articulate my skills. No, generate my generation students scored themselves highly. We developed a framework for delivering career coaching using an adult to adult dynamic model of coaching to enable the first generation student to claim career power over their future and access a trusted other consistently through a whole 12 months. Coaching is provided to facilitate an accelerated move towards their goals, but the student very much drives the process. My generation of students have built quite a reputation for being extremely motivated and focused when engaging to maximise career success. They claim career power by using their coaches as a resource to expand their networks, gain insight into labour market and self-reflect. Coaching delivers six one hour sessions, offering a service to clarify goals, develop strategies, implement actions and reflect. We use Egan to empower students to identify where they are now, they, where they want to be, and how to get there and coaching is created with cards, physical props, visualisation and drawing exercises facilitating the process. At each coaching intervention students use a one to six scale to assess themselves against the project success factors of quality of LinkedIn profile, self-awareness, self-confidence, career activism and career vision. Within one year from January to December 2019, all success factors have demonstrated a sustained increase on average of 1.2 on 1 to 6 scale, with the highest increase of 1.7 points for quality of LinkedIn profile. During all three interim reporting periods, all factors increased apart from in one instance. And the fact that this increase was continued and persistent throughout the full 12 months without interruption means that new behaviours have a good chance of being sustained. By the end of the project cycle, we had recorded 105 engagements with the project Opportunity Success Factors, more than four per student, which was an increase from less than two per student on average at the start of the project cycle. So via targeted and well-designed and thought out interventions, we can make a positive impact in order for students to become more powerful over their futures, increase awareness of themselves, how to move forward in their career, and of course, the graduate labour market. But to end on something inspiring that is happening by students, for students to empower themselves, you may be aware of the 93% Club. It is an awe-inspiring student society founded by Sophie Pender at University of Bristol and expanded to many other universities. The society claims power by its name. 93% of the UK population is state school educated. We are not a minority. The society aims to level the playing field by providing their own students with events, opportunities and opportunities exclusively for state educated students. So to summarise, there are differences between those who were the first member of their family to attend university and those whose parents did participate in HE. Intangible differences, financial differences, vocal differences, attitudes, wealth, career, career vision and many more. These differences have an impact. First generation students are less likely to obtain a positive graduate destination. And it is the responsibility of all university career services to change, to value and nurture first generation students in order for them to claim power over their own futures. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Um, and I'm sure you are already thinking of many questions that you'd like to ask uh, both Heather and Jamie um, now. And remember, please do put them in the uh, question and answer box and we will um, uh, get to them once all of the presentations um, are finished. I'd now like to introduce um, Laden Hong from uh, King's College. 
uh, London. Um, Laden's going to provide us with an insight into the mechanics, the successes and the challenges faced um, by delivering a targeted careers intervention to underrepresented groups. So thank you, Laden. Thank you, Deirdre. Um, my name is Laden, as Deirdre said, and I'm the Widening Participation Careers Consultant at King's College London, um, and I'll be talking a bit about my programme called Careers Plus. Um, so a little bit about, about me. So I've worked in pre-entry WP for over 10 years, um, focusing on uh, WP students, delivering programmes, um, and I started at King's College London in 2018 as the Widening Participation and Careers Consultant. It was a very new role. Uh, it was a new um, concept across uh, the country as well, fairly new. Um, so I was sort of tasked with finding out how I would be working best with these students. My focus was on pre-entry students, on-course students and graduate it's a quite a large remit um, but we uh, sort of came to the conclusion that from the research that creating a bespoke and tailored provision for on-course students would be great to do that so we uh, created Chris Plus so a bit about the sort of mechanics behind the research and uh, preparation for creating and delivering Careers Plus. Um, I attended a lot of conferences, events, um, read up on best practice within King's, how we worked within the WP um, group um, and also external. Um, the Social Mobility and University Career Services report by the Bridge Group uh, was really important in my work, um, kind of realising that WP students took part in less extracurricular society, you know, activities such as societies at university, um, so they potentially didn't build the same employability skills through extracurricular activities um, as their more privileged peers um, and the sort of importance of sense of belonging and early engagement with this um, cohort. Um, also data, um, we looked at um, kind of the fact that King's body, uh, student body was um, getting more and more diverse. For example, the black and Asian minority ethnic students increased by 10% across five years, and they now account for 52% of UK domiciled students. Um, and I also ran a focus group with WP students to um, kind of really gauge their understanding, what we meant by WP, the term, how what they felt about careers. Um, they said they find careers quite intimidating, which was, you know, a bit of a surprise, but also that they were really aware that they kind of lack that social and cultural capital. They just did not know what they did not know, essentially. Um, but they really encouraged and welcomed a targeted intervention. Um, and this was all against this sort of backdrop um, of the fact that, you know, social mobility has been stagnant in the UK as per the 2019 Social Mobility Commission report. Um, and the fact that even if they enter professional jobs, they earn 17% less than their privileged colleagues. Um, so, you know, knowing all of this, then I had to start thinking about the practical aspects of creating and delivering um, a bespoke provision. So it was kind of thinking, is this an opt in programme or uh, do we just automatically assign them and they can opt out? What are the kind of technical um, capabilities of our systems? What are the eligibility criteria? Who can be part of the program? And then also the marketing advertising. How do we actually tell the students about this um, program? Um, so taking all those things into consideration, we um, created uh, a program called Careers Plus. So this is what the program looks like to my students. Um, I, it was officially launched in September 2019 um, and I now have uh, 1,100 students on to this program. Um, in terms of eligibility, they are uh, have to be UK domicile students, undergraduate, and they have to meet one or four, uh, one or more of 14 uh, markers. Um, and those markers range from uh, being in receipt of the King's Living Bursary, which is based on household income, for, to Roma uh, Gypsy Traveller students and care experience students and so on. Um, and students opt into this by filling in a form to apply. Once they're onto the programme, they have access to um, longer appointments. Uh, whereas at the moment they're 20 minute appointments so with they have longer appointments they're all uh, with myself I deliver those and they can book in advance um, 
and I also been working really hard on developing exclusive internship opportunities with employers, uh, working collaboration with our uh, internships team at King's um, and also uh, delivering uh, informal drop in sessions to kind of go away from that uh, feeling of intimidation, then feeling intimidated by careers um, and also exclusive um, employer events and also career topic workshops which are tailored to them. So we have an amazing core um, service delivery at King's, uh, but this kind of sits out what's the additional needs um, for these students. Um, so yeah that's kind of and, and in addition to that we also I also run employer kind of projects and internships so in the past I've done the global internship program again the stats show that uh, students from uh, WP backgrounds participate less in uh, outward mobility and um, so we ran a global ship a global internship program for nine students and sent them to Hong Kong for four weeks um, it was over a six month period uh, pro part of a six month program um, where we did tailored workshops to support them through that process and we also had a micro internship within that uh, almost like a stepping stone to get them familiar with the idea of kind of going abroad but also working abroad um, and that was really successful and this year we're doing KPM uh, KPMG projects uh, and carrying on with some of those micro internships. Um, so what were the challenges that I faced? So there's lots of challenges um, um, with anything setting up a new project. So some of these probably are familiar to yourselves if you've set up a project, um, but the sort of main ones were um, of course resources. So I work part time three days a week and I deliver all the one to one appointments and create the workshops and deliver the workshops. Um, I have a great obviously team that um, collaborate with kind of the projects with me. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of one of the it kind of restraints, I guess. Um, of course, funding, trying to find funding to, to do some of the projects um, and also how do we reach the hard to reach students? Um, that sort of challenge of really getting the word out there. Um, another challenge has been managing expectations. Um, so managing expectations um, from employers. So I have a lot of conversations with employers and I've sort of come to realise that their idea of what uh, diversity and inclusion means to them as a firm or company uh, might be different to how we um, the kind of idea that we have here at King's um, and I'm quite protective of my co cohort um, of course with recent events like uh, Black Lives Matters there's been a surge in kind of interest in this area and so I feel quite protective of my students and have to really manage and put expectations um, and also student expectations balancing what they think they need so there's huge focus on internships uh, particularly at King's they see their peers um, to what they perceive having joined amazing internships and so that's what they think that they need which it's of course valuable, but at the same time, it's kind of balancing that with what we think they need um, as a career service, kind of focusing on confidence, uh, networking, resilience and so on. Um, data and research is a bit of a challenge because there just isn't a lot of um, data and research out there. There's focus has been on getting in rather than getting on um, for this cohort um, and also internal data. So I can't uh, there's lack of data on certain WP markers um, so it's kind of hard to get all the information that I need and also the fact that WP students are not a homogenous group so um, it's hard to find you know that you have to really break down that cohort and um, so it takes a lot of upskilling and constant learning about this group um, and the last challenge I kind of wanted to raise was something that I didn't quite expect um, which was uh, my own well-being uh, and of course the well-being of my students there's a lot of emotional labour that's involved in um, delivering one-to-one -one appointments and uh, and even workshops because they're tailored uh, in my case around the barriers that these students face a lot of these barriers are surfaced and, and concerns that they have in one-to-one -one, so I can sometimes walk away from an appointment really kind of drained um, and so you know it's hard work but of course also really um, you know, uh, such privilege to actually have this engagement and live uh, have students share their lived experience with me um so the successes so there's um you saw that first image um of the person which is meant to represent me with this with the heart eyes it's because i do love my job and i'm so um it's 
you know it's great working with these students and the kind of success that I would say this program brings is that it works towards helping students with that sense of belonging so um, if they do feel like a fish out of water at university it's hopefully saying that we have this bespoke program for you um, I try to have early engagement the fact that it's always with me so there's a bit of consistency and the tailored workshops and um, that sort of sit outside of our core provision um, hopefully helps with the with that sort of sense of belonging and the fact that myself that I come from a WP background that they can hopefully feel understood and can relate uh, when I'm delivering and working with them. Um, addressing uh, hopefully my work also it's addressing sort of the lack of social capital that some of these students might have, lack of cultural and family capital as well and so I provide opportunities to network with employers that come from similar backgrounds to them um, and also um, kind of hopefully giving them confidence and guidance on how to build relationships and networks and also with the ring fenced opportunities um, so they know that this opportunity is just for me. Um, the other thing that I try to create is a safe space so it's I'm always delivering so hopefully we'll be able to build that trust with the students um, but I also try to allow them room to kind of surface any issues and uh, concerns that they have acknowledge those issues and we hopefully can work towards building confidence and strategies on how to manage um, those concerns um, and also mindful use of language that's really important to me really being careful and mindful of the language that I use with my students um, and uh, the sort of last success I'd just like to highlight is just kind of focusing I think my program I really try to work on focusing on kind of the why and the value behind why I do certain things why I ask certain questions in one-to-ones for example or why um, kind of what's the value for example like why do I ask you to tailor your CV for employers um, just because so these students can understand this cohort can understand why um, uh, yeah why you know we ask them uh, certain things within the career space um, so yeah that that's it for me really I just like to kind of say um, that my of course my work goes beyond this I think it's really important to integrate uh, equity and inclusivity in all aspects of careers and not just kind of focusing on one bespoke program um, but yeah um, I think that's um, pretty much it for me thank you very much and um, if you do have any questions that we don't get to answer during this session feel free to um, send me an email Thank you, Laudan. Um, I'm seeing questions coming in now, so um, thanks for that. And some really, really um, great questions that are coming in. So um, I'm just warning the panel now. Prepare to uh, to to answer to answer them. Um, finally, um, I would like to introduce Professor Tristram Hooley. Um, delighted that um, he's been able to join us today, um, and he's asking us the question: Maybe it's time for us to change the water. Um, this is a social approach to supporting careers in a changing world. So thank you, Tristram. Great. Um, can you see those slides? All right. Should be a, a picture of a, a woman changing some water in yes. sort of delightfully literal <laughs> version of my uh, title. Um, yeah, so I suppose, I mean, I mean, so lots of what I'm going to say, I suppose, is an attempt to sort of theorise some of the things we've been hearing so far so there's there's i mean a lot of the examples of practice that people have described i think are gonna you know give you a, re a re really good example of the sorts of things that i'm talking about so so i'll try and pick up some some links for as, as i go through but i suppose this idea of a fish out of water and i'm going to give you a little bit of background on that that phrase and how it comes to be used an awful lot um it, th there's a danger with it that it it picks up the idea that well you know uh, young people who come from a uh, disadvantaged background, however we, we define that, whether that's class based or race based or whatever, um, that, that it's really their job to change and to become more like uh, the, the, the people in the environment, the majority culture. And I mean, Heather talks about that really nicely about how actually you know that's not really a reasonable expectation why is it that 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 middle class or advantaged young people don't have to change when they get to university and working class people do that that seems wrong to me so is there a question that what we should be doing when we're thinking about careers and when we're thinking about 
um, sort of transitions into and out of university is what we should be thinking about is about how we actually change the institutions as much as we try and support the individuals to change. But of course, careers work is is about supporting individuals. So we have to do a bit of both of those. And, and what I'm going to try and give you is an idea about how you might go about doing that. So people, we've already talked about this quite a lot, but it's, you know, there's, there's definitely, I mean, there's all sorts of different uh, factors that, that shape unequal outcomes. So people from working class backgrounds, a lot of the same issues could be said if you look to other sort of intersections of of uh, disadvantage. So if you looked at uh, uh, ethnicity or if you looked at disability or whatever. Um, but people from working class backgrounds are more likely to be unemployed, more likely to be paid below the living wage. Um, they are less on average than more advantaged peers. They're less likely to be in a professional job and university goes some way towards narrowing that. So for the, those people who are from a, a working class background who go to university um, are more likely to achieve professional jobs and so on than those who don't. But but even so, the, there is, as various people have presented already, there still remains this gap. So what can we do about it and, and why does this exist? Well, um, there's quite a lot, I think, that career theory can help us with on this. And, and so there's um, what's what's sometimes called a sort of opportunity structure theory com coming from people like Ken Roberts. And, and what that takes issue with is this idea that's really important in in careers is that the career career kind of development is all about choice making and that you have to make your choices and you have to kind of shape your life uh, through the exercise of your choice. And of course, that is true to an extent. But what, what Roberts and, and, and theorists like that say is in reality, Yes, we do make choices, but often we are more like the goldfish in the bowl. We, we can make choices about which way to swim, whether to go up or down, but we're actually incredibly constrained by the opportunities that are available to us. And, you know, and in the end, we just go go round and round. So so sometimes these the, the feeling we have of making choices is actually a bit of an illusion. And, and this kind of society and social constraints that sit around us uh, um, actually prevent us really from exercising choice. Well, that's not really um, a sort of complete explanation because we all know that, that um, you know, people do exceed the, the immediacy of, their, of the constraints that, that, that are around them. So, you know, working class kids do go to university and go on to get really good jobs and earn really good money, but most don't, but some do. So there is this thing about choice. And so there's a sort of bunch of theorists, and this is where the fish out of water idea really comes from, and particularly uh, around the, the work of, uh, of Bourdieu, Pierre Bourdieu, who talks about this idea of the fish out of water, and he 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 uses this idea of habitus. So habitus is is the way we think, the way we kind of internalise a lot of the ideas that are around us. So. I think of this in, in terms of a lot of careers work is really about trying to juggle with both the sort of internal factors. So someone's internal psychology, their motivation, resilience, self-efficacy, their career management skills and so on. The things that we have kind of inside us and are our individual capabilities and then our external structures. So the labour market, the education system, politics and society. And what Bourdieu and people like that would say okay, is, is that the idea that habitus is is what kind of links this so habitus is is our understanding uh, of the external world but it, it's also a, an internal thing it's a, it's our kind of it's our psychological reality but it's actually an, our internalization of the external things and so the, the most kind of classic example of that is when people say something like well people like me don't go to university or people like me don't get jobs like that. That's that's habitus in operation because that's that's us internalizing these external structures and saying, well, these things that, that are external structures, we're going to bring them into our psychology. We're going to make them into our ideas about what is and isn't possible for us. So the positives when we when we think about career, you know, if we focus on the internal, you focus on what you can control. And so that's one of the reasons why it's really appealing for us uh, as careers professionals is it's, it's much easier to help people to get more motivated or increase their resilience or their, their kind of self-efficacy, their belief in their self and so on. We can do things with people that can help that. 
and that's so that's a that's a good reason to focus on the internal but if we focus on the external and we try and change some of these things it's quite difficult but if we can do it it expands the possibilities that are available to people but the negative size is that if we only focus on the individual and on their internal psychology we responsabilize it so we make them feel that it's their fault so if I'm not doing well, if I'm not kind of exceeding my background, if I'm not becoming a sort of captain of industry or whatever, I'm, I'm somehow failing. And, and that focus on the individual can be sort of uh, this idea of responsabilization. So it makes you feel like you're responsible for things that you're not entirely responsible for. And if you focus only on the external, then you can you can create a kind of sense of fatalism that like, well, it doesn't matter what I do, you know, I'm not going to dismantle capitalism so why why am I, I why why should i even try you know that kind of thing so what tony watt said is well career guidance is right in the middle of all of this stuff it's it, when you're engaging with people through career guidance you're engaged in a profoundly political process and you're operating at the in, interface between the individual and society self and opportunity aspiration and realism and, and because of that, career guidance is really political. And, and Tony goes on to talk about how that works. So he says, well, there are four different ways you can think about that. Well, on one hand, you can focus on society. The other, you can focus on the individual. Well, I've kind of talked about that already. The other thing is you can focus on change or you can focus on stability. By using, by recognising these two dimensions that you can get when you're working with someone on their career, he comes up with these four ideologies of guidance. So we start with the one that probably most guidance people are taught when they first are taught, which is the idea you should be non-directive. You shouldn't you shouldn't um, try and influence people. So you're focusing on the individual and you're not trying to change them. You're letting them decide how much they want to change. And then, you know, what career guidance is often uh, accused of is that it's about sort of slotting people into place. So you know, it's about sending people to the place where they most fit. So that's the kind of conservative perspective, what's, what he calls a social control perspective. So that's focusing on stability, but on society. And, and you see that in, in the kind of modern age in, in, in agendas like the STEM agenda. So it's the idea, well, we need more people who can do STEM and, you know, engineering or whatever. And so we need career guidance people to encourage people to pursue that that route in the in the kind of interests of society. Where a lot of the kind of widening participation stuff starts from is this idea of individual change or progressive uh, guidance. So we're trying to help people to exceed and challenge and move beyond the, the immediate constraints of society. And, and in doing that, we want to help people to, you know, move away from uh, communities that don't offer them opportunities, give them give them kind of opportunities to move on and move up and get better jobs and, and do better than their parents and so on. Then you've got the kind of radical perspective, which says, well, look, OK, that's fine. But why should people have to? Why is it that there are some communities where there is no opportunity? Why is it there are people from some backgrounds where there is no opportunity? Shouldn't wouldn't it be better to actually do something about that? And that kind of perspective would be critical of the progressive perspective because it would say, well, in helping these working class people, for example, to get to the top of industry, what you end up doing is robbing working class communities of some of their best and their brightest. And, and you, you give up on the idea that we can actually improve that community and you, you just say, well, let's just find the best people and get them out of there. So what says, well, there are all these different sort of perspectives that you can take and what I'm going to um, uh, what I wanted to talk about is actually is more the radical perspective. So I think the progressive perspective is where a lot of widening participation his, um, activity historically sits. Radical perspective is what I'm interested in talking about. I'm going to present you with a model that helps us to think about what does that look like in practice. So in, in a couple of books that I've done with uh, Ronald Sultana and Rhea Thompson, we've developed what we call these five signposts towards a socially just career guidance. And I'm just going to quickly whiz through them. And what it is, is a framework for thinking about practice, which helps you to actually um, help people to think about how they can both both kind of change their life, that kind of progressive idea of moving on, but also how they can potentially change the environment and the circumstances around them. 
So uh, the first one is critical consciousness, and that's really just about helping people to understand the world that they're living in. So the, the point in terms of the, the, the fish and the water that we've been talking about here is to help people really think about, well, what is this water that I'm in and why is it different from the water I was in? And what, whose interest does that serve? And really help them to deconstruct the environment that they're, they're sitting in. Um, so it's not just to conform, but it's to understand. So it's really an educative aim. The second thing is to is to name oppression. So if you feel you're being discriminated against, um, and like there's been a load of really shocking examples recently, which we saw from Durham University. I don't know whether people saw this about the kind of class prejudice that that was is sort of baked into some of the the practices in that institution. Um, and and it. One of the things we can do is just when people bring those things to us as career guidance practitioners, we can help them to name it. And a really good example of that in the in a sort of gender context would be the Me Too movement, which was about naming oppression. It wasn't necessarily saying that simply by naming it, we can solve all the problems. But actually, it's incredibly empowering if people say, yeah, I am being I am being um, kind of stereotyped. I am being um, discriminated against and this is why and, and I'm just going to name that that happens. The third thing is that we should help people to question what's normal and that's that point that Heather made I think that we um, you know why should why is it that some people's culture is seen as normal and other people's culture is not? Why is it some people's accent is seen as normal and other people's accent is seen as kind of funny or different or amusing or exotic? And we should really be encouraging people to think about that and question that. Again, it doesn't mean there's there's no case in which you would want to help people to kind of figure out how to conform and how to how to fit in. But you also want to, I think, be critical of that idea of just fitting in. Our fourth idea is the idea that we should encourage people to work together and that many career issues are not solvable just by an individual getting on and doing better and being having more career management skills or being more motivated. Sometimes it actually requires people to come together to support each other or in the case of, you know, this is a trade union example of people perhaps coming together in order to change the circumstances in which they actually operate. So it may be that um, our, our hope of getting better pay is better pursued through collective bargaining than it is through seeking a promotion. And finally, we need to think about how do we work at a range of different levels? Because as a career guidance practitioner, we tend to focus on what we're doing one to one with in a kind of um, counselling or advisory context. But we also need to recognise that if we notice things when we're, we're working with clients and we say, actually, I think there might be a real problem in the Department of Biology um, because those the people all the students I see from there say are talking about how um, you know how much discrimination they're getting or how much how many problems they're having. Maybe I should try and reflect back to the system that there's problems in that, or or perhaps an employer. Um, whenever I send a black student to a particular employer, they never get a job. Well, maybe I notice that as somebody who's in a position, and I perhaps want to ring up that employer and do something. Um, our point here is that. You're doing career guidance whatever level you're working at. So if you're helping someone in their career by just talking to them, supporting them to think about their life, that's career guidance. If you're working with a group to help bring them together, that's career guidance. If you're linking uh, a student with an employer, that's career guidance. But also if you're reflecting back on the system, if you're campaigning, if you're providing critical commentary, that's also career guidance as well. So. There's various references here. If you're interested, I'll post these uh, slides on my blog uh, as well as you'll be able to have access to them through this session. But I think my summary really is that individual solutions can't solve everyone's career issues. And so career guidance then needs to engage with the wider context to open up more opportunities for people. And this um, five, five signposts is a, hopefully a practical way that I think links with many of the examples of practice we've already heard. Uh, that you can use. Um, there's my blog there, it's called Adventures in Career Development. Thank you. Thank you, Tristram, um, and thank you to all of our presenters. Um, I think, uh, well, I certainly have really um, 
got a lot out of those four presentations and we've got um, a lot of questions um, so I'm not going to kind of faff around and uh, I'm going to get straight to the point. We are we are actually um, in this webinar until 2.30 um, because what we've found um, in the past is that uh, just as the good questions start coming, uh, it's time to leave. So appreciate that some of you will have to, to, to go because you've only got a, 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 um, a, an hour or so lunch. Um, but we will we will continue until until 3.30. So I'm going to ask um, a question um, to all of the panel uh, to start off with. Um, and this is from a colleague um, at York St. John. So um, they're looking at how they approach um, induction, creating a sense of belonging and careers thinking um, at York St. John. It strikes me that this can be uh, key for getting student buy-in to careers thinking, but also their own progression and success. Have any of the panel got any key thoughts to share particularly around targeted activity or key early messages to students. So that's really about induction. Um, is there any of the panel that would like to start with that one? Um, I, I'm happy to say something. <coughs> um, I think, I think um, it's really important, particularly as a first impression for WP students as they enter the space of higher education um, to receive the right message in terms of language used. I think if language used is about any, it gives a message of any deficit, sorry, any deficit or any, um, any attributes or lacking, it can really kind of um, pave a pathway for lack of confidence which has to be kind of mopped up later um, by projects like this. Um, so I think kind of just having that joined up approach throughout the student life cycle in terms of positive language and um, and really don't send the message of deficit lacking um, and, and the difference needs to just be um, factual in terms of the writing on the wall. For, for example, things like Delhi to raise awareness and then other services that they've already paid for, that they use as a resource, yeah, and not be framed as saving or helping. Brilliant, thanks. Uh, Jamie, you'd also like to um, come in on this one. Yeah, so um, what would be really, really good would be to get a local business involved, perhaps, if, if a business could come in perhaps where it's, it's an alumnus from the university um, you know, or, or a business that, that is, is working closely with the university. It could be small, it could be, it could be large. But I think that the key messages um, that would be really good to come from that business would be to um, encouraging students to be thinking about developing transferable skills. So some of the, the skills that they're going to be developing on their course the more sort of technical, the, the kind of the obvious ones, but also thinking about some of those sort of softer skills and the, um, other things that they will be developing on the course, but also be developing outside of, of the lecture theatre, if you like, um, and perhaps going on and doing their own sort of work experience. But you know, thinking about how they can start developing skills, um, you know, re record those, um, and then be working with the careers team to be in a position where they can articulate those skills to future employers. That would be something that would be really good to, to involve at the beginning. Lovely. OK, thanks very much. OK, um, I've got a question. Actually, I'm going to go back to um, Heather on this one. Um, this is a specific question to Heather. Um, Heather, are you running the My Generation coaching programme again this year? And will you be doing anything different this year than you did last year? And how many participants are you expecting? Well, yes, we are running it very differently this year. Um, we run from January to December. It's a 12 month cycle. So um, um, obviously this, this, the participants started in January and by the time we started working from home, we were offering that remote coaching. We've delivered more hours than we had done at this point um, last year. And we had to we had to stick with 25 participants, unfortunately, due to um, to various reasons within the department. But we are um, hoping to open up 
to that wider pool of don't know um, applicants. And I'm getting some ideas from Larden as, uh, as well about um, adapting the service, but um, it, it will be very much a coaching um, model because we feel that it's worked really effectively. Lovely. OK, thank you. Um, and a question um, to Larden um, and actually to, to all of you, but initially to, to Larden and if anybody else would like to 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 um, to, to add in. Um, this particular person thinks that the programme um, is really is a really great idea, but what do you uh, why do you think this is not rolled out to more universities, particularly those that have a strong focus of recruiting widening participation students? Um, and why uh, not the same focus on helping them push on after graduation? So um, to you, Laden, but I would like to to uh, hear from the others as well, please. Um, thank you. I think I think that's quite a difficult question. I, I don't know why. <laughs> I think it's quite a new, um, the widening participation careers consultant as a role is quite new. Um, and I think it, it would, it, it all varies university uh, by university. In my previous uh, role, um, I worked for a post-92 uh, university. So the co cohort were mainly WP. So having like a bespoke tailored programme might, that would basically mean all their students almost. So it wouldn't quite work. So I think it really depends on the university, their data um, and how they work. I would really encourage um, university career services to really integrate uh, this into their service, uh, into their core delivery. Um, and I think oh, I'm slightly sidetracking, but I think it really good with that induction question as well in terms of I think it's really important to well, what Heather said about language, being really mindful of language, but also of representation. So when you are promoting career services, making sure the imagery that you use in your promotion and the type of activities that you're doing um, kind of sit comfortably with students from uh, widening participation backgrounds. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, rather than focusing on a particular programme, which is great to do if there is a need for it, um, but also just being conscious that really we need to be um, making sure the whole service um, is, is because it's only going to help all students, I think, that if we are conscious of um, how we, if we integrate it into everything, it's going to benefit everybody, not just WP students. Mm -hmm. I don't think that answers the question. But <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. And I think I think one of the things um, um, before I kind of invite um, the other panel members to, to 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 participate in this is is around the fact that um, you know in terms of widening participation, um, widening participation teams are very used to the word targeting and very used to uh, being comfortable around the word of of targeting uh, specific groups. Whereas I think with career services we're still very much a central service. Um, and I think it's 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 very it's still a very new area um, to kind of navigate in. And I think that that's really important. I don't know whether anybody else wants to kind of come in on that. No, they don't. <laughs> I, I mean, I mean let, I'll, I'll say something about targeted. Yeah. I think you have to be quite careful with, with targeted approaches because I think there's a danger that you end up um, sort of uh, you know, you you don't people, you don't want to set up services in a way that when people come in the door that that they are told that there's a load of things either there's a load of things they can't have or that there is there's a set of things that they can have if they meet certain criteria. I mean, there's there's research on career guidance which tells us that and and various forms of kind of career support services which tell us that actually if we if we're able to offer good services to everyone, the impact will be greater on those. Who, who have who need it more so if you know i think to me the aspiration is always to have a kind of inclusive universal service which people come in for and then once you're in that service some people might need more support they might need to then be directed to additional additional things i mean that's not to say that there isn't value in doing particular outreach at particular times but but i think so, you know sometimes some of the ways that some of the widening participation work in schools when was it was so exclusive and it was so targeted that it ended up, you know, both stigmatised, but it also became very difficult for schools to actually operationalise it. So, so I'd, I'd just be a bit careful before you kind of throw out all, all of the sort of universal tradition that career mm -hmm. services have. Hello, um, 
Completely fair, yeah, completely fair enough, Tristan. I, I, I think what I was trying to say there was the fact that widening participation teams um, are more used to the to, to to the to the concept of targeting, and they're therefore, um, you know, it's it's not either either or. But anyway, I absolutely um, um, agree with you, Tristan. Can I ask you another question from um, a member of the um, participants? Um, can you give an example of a career service that is actually putting into practice? Um, your five signposts of action. Um, so we've got a website which is called uh, uh, Career Guidance for Social Justice. And on that, we've been trying to get um, people to share examples of, of it. So I suppose one, actually, one of the things I'd start by saying is that what, what we're doing in that framework is not, it's not a kind of, you know, bang, here's a brilliant idea no one's ever thought of it before. It's trying to describe practices that already exist so so all of the things that I've described are things which already exist what what I think we've tried to do in in the book and the book is a, a collection of of examples of different um different practices that people people see and the website kind of extends that so what we tried to do is say well look actually if you if you take all the things that people are doing and you try and create some description that people can work with that says, well, look, if you if you want to do something with it, then here's five things that you might want to think about. That that's really what we we've, we've tried to do. But yeah, we have got um, examples of of people who are trying to kind of explicitly work with those those five um, signposts as a framework. I don't think any HE career services have, have, have talked to us about that. But I mean, obviously, you know, this this is not proprietary things, so people can do stuff with it. But um, uh, there's a lot of people in a lot of the, some, a lot of these ideas come from some of the Nordic countries and people have been trying to kind of work with them more explicitly in, in places like Denmark and Norway and so on. But so that's a very woolly answer. But if you go to the if you go to the website, you'll see a lot of quite practical examples of people doing the kinds of stuff that I talked about. And in fact, you know, both both what Heather and Loden gave today were, were you know, had lots of the features that I described, I think. Mm -hmm. OK. Thank you. Um, questions, a couple of questions now for, for, for Laden. Um, can you, uh, so why did you decide to make the Careers Plus an opt-in um, provision? And also, what are your plans for the um, micro internships going forward? Um, and how are you going to be able to facilitate these within uh, the current COVID situation? Um, OK, so the reason we chose to do opt in is around some of the kind of um, issues that were raised here in terms of really um, being mindful that not all students wanted to be labelled um, and that it wasn't something that we were going to automatically say because you're from a WP background, you need this service from that space where it was really if they identified with the need for having um, for wanting additional help they could opt in but also on a practical level um, it's um, like I said lack of data I don't know who all the Roma Gypsy Traveller students are for example um, at King's I don't know who all the estranged students are um, often students also uh, say students with dis uh, who are with disabilities um, they might indicate that when they sign up to university um, and some might not and then they might find later on as they go through their uh, university uh, lives that situations change um, and so on so yeah there was kind of trying to not exclude anybody or force them into a program um, combined with the lack of data to do those do so practically um, so yeah that's why we chose to do an opt-in um, and yes the micro internships so the micro internships are a one-week program um, and so they yes they're all going to be virtual we're hoping for this cohort so and we're also hoping to recruit uh, King's uh, professional services departments that are able to host students virtually um, and I collaborate with a great King's internships team um, and who doing at the moment huge work around delivering virtual um, um, internships and there's platforms as well um, to help employers who are willing to do virtual internships um, so that's kind of how we've adapted but it's taken a while to do so. Lovely, um, thank you. Um, this is a question uh, for all the panel. Um, what do you think happens to career support uh, for students once they've left university um, graduates um, and are these this year's um, graduates 
struggling? Um, kind of an obvious question, but not necessarily so. I don't know who. So. Yeah. Christopher. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, it, it's a real problem, I think. I mean, it, so the, the truth is that it varies a lot. So um, some universities offer, you know, really good follow up services and support um, and others offer very little. For some, that's quite cynically about getting people for the graduate outcomes uh, uh, measure, which is the sort of metric that the universities have got. And so it dries up quite quickly after that, uh, while for others they'll offer a lifelong entitlement. But I think the honest truth is that once you leave education, whatever form of education you're in, your entitlement to access career guidance drops and you have to be really quite aware to know that it exists. So even if your university does offer something, you have to know that, you have to go and reach out and find out how you go and access that and so on. Um, and beyond that, the only service that you're likely to be able to get is the National Careers Service, which is quite a limited service unless you're you're essentially long term unemployed. So, you know, it's a I think it's a really big problem and, and I think universities, I mean, universities have a role to play in it. I think at the moment, if, if you know, I was the university lobby, I would be arguing really strongly that the government should be funding universities to provide ongoing support for graduates for like up to two years or up to three years after they leave and to publicise that service and to say that you could get it and so on. But at the moment, I think what you'll find is a very patchy, inconsistent service um, and you know, and you're, and it will be down to people being quite proactive to find what they can. Lovely, thank you. We've got Jamie, and then we've also got Larden, who'd like to respond as well to that. So, uh, Jamie. Yeah, sure. So, in uh, in Enterprise M3, um, you know, as uh, well, earlier this year, something I, I did is I reached out to all of the careers and employability teams in the universities in our area. So that's uh, University of Southampton, University of Winchester, University of Surrey. Uh, Royal Holloway and uh, University for Creative Arts and and you know, sort of asked you know what what, what support is, is being offered and something I was particularly keen um, to ask about was the the sort of the, the careers careers fairs that um, that uh, and jobs fairs that, that tend to happen you know in this this sort of term and in fact all of them came back and said where where they're taking place we are inviting our you know, twenty our cohort you know, our class of twenty twenty if you like to come back because they're they're virtual. Um, it, it's you know, there's no harm in offering it to them. So actually, you know, the, the employers uh, were being then presented with um, students who are going to be graduating next year, but actually graduates from this year as well, who are ready to, to take on those jobs. So that was sort of really positive. And notice that the, the careers and employability teams in, in all of the universities have been really keen to learn more about what we're doing as, as a LEP, to learn more about the, um, the, the local area, particularly where um, graduates and students in the past have kind of looked more to, to London now they're realising that actually with working from home um, being being incredibly popular um, they can they can look at more sort of local jobs and, and want to learn more about it so um, it's really good to see some support from our local universities. Lovely uh, thank you thank you Jamie. Um, Laden you wanted to respond just very briefly, I mean, we uh, at King's do offer um, support for two years after graduation, but again, it's something that we really need to uh, publicise. Um, one of the things that we did um, this year as well was we over the summer, we focused on delivering almost like a boot camp of sessions, again, for all students. So it, it was with particularly uh, students from WP backgrounds in mind, um, but again, it was for all students kind of having that um, kind of yeah, very tailored um, support that sits outside of a core services with uh, this kind of COVID implications in mind, but also our employer team do great work around sharing LMI um, and kind of what's happening um, and sharing that with our students to kind of help them make decisions uh, or adapt. And so, yeah, that also helps, I think. Thank you. Um, I know, you know, within within my institution, we've only uh, we've got, um, you know, six careers consultants um, who, uh, you know, a very small team. Um, and we do obviously provide um, and advertise the fact that um, we're offering support for graduates um, two years beyond their um, 
their degree. Um, but again, it's about the fact that we are such a small service, and we're we're, we're supporting we're supporting, um, you know, our our undergraduates as well as our postgraduates as well. So um, it's a it's a it's a it's a difficult one to to. Um, to 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 sort really, um, Laden. Um, back to you and careers uh, careers plus. Do you receive uh, referrals straight from pre entry WP and outreach um, also, or and do you align um, targets to your King's um, access and participation plan? Um, yes, so when I created the programme, the 14 markers were based around um, the kind of uh, cohort of um, students that the pre-entry team work with. So there is um, the students that they target, then once they're at King's, then they are kind of listed on my, um, on my essentially in the form when they apply. And there is no direct um, entry because the way that King's pre-entry uh, programmes work is that they do this pre-entry work and then the students apply um, and then once they are on uh, at King's, it's almost uh, they don't kind of follow through, if that makes sense. So um, but what I do is one of my markers is if you've been on a King's uh, pre entry program. So that's if you if you've been part of any of the work that we do at pre entry, that is one of the sort of tick boxes that they would tick when they apply to go on to my program. But I do connect when, I, when it comes down to the advertising the program. That's where I connect with um, staff at pre-entry, but also student advisors that work with these uh, groups to get the word out. Um, so there's a connection there, but not an kind of a direct route in, onto the programme. OK, so you do work um, with the widening participation team. Fairly well, you know, sort of like very closely. Yes, there's definitely. Um, so I also help pre-entry students. Um, I kind of consult, I deliver workshops for their pre-entry projects that they do. Um, so it, yeah, there is a connection there and they send me information and I send them information. So yes. Lovely, thank you. Um, a question to everybody. Um, to what extent is there a tendency among widening participation students to see higher education as uh, as a vocational undertaking, whereas other students might tend to see it more uh, rounded exercise in personal development. So does that does that mean that WP students uh, might be too narrowly focused on their course or on their particular career to enjoy the full benefits of developing uh, the wider employability skills through HE? I mean, I do know that we 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 get the same students doing all of the employability programmes or quite a lot. Um, so um, yeah, was that, was that Tristram saying that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think this is a really interesting point and it's not something that perhaps people have talked about as much as, as they could do, but I've just done some research on this and we found that, yeah, there was definitely a, like a significant, um, significantly greater focus on sort of vocational factors amongst um, uh, working class and and also uh, non-white students were, were all tending to say things like I want a job which I could, where I can sort of directly use my my degree and like that's not an I mean that's not a stupid or unreasonable thing to to think is it I mean and, and especially given that that people have been sold university very sort of substantially around the idea that it will get you a job yeah um, I think I think one of the one well, I think in some cases it can work in people's advantage if if what your aim is is to get a good job and move on fairly well. I think where it can it can sometimes uh, undo you on that is if you end up if is it, is it narrows your your belief in what is possible for you. And so, um, like the employers I work with in the Institute of Student Empl Employers generally don't care about what degree people have done. I mean, they quite like people who've got a bit of numeracy and, and so on, but they're not they're not particularly looking for people who've done one particular degree. So the, you know, the finance people aren't looking for business or economics people particularly. Uh, the, you know, the, the, the pharma companies aren't necessarily looking for people from one particular ba uh, scientific background. So people, uh, I think if, if students get the idea that that they have to have a very narrow uh, alignment between their degree and their and their um, ultimate job, then that could be a problem. And, and that's part of what we're trying to do. I mean, 
it's that idea of trying to raise people's awareness about the labour market, about how it works, about what employers are actually looking for, get them talking to employers, all of that sort of stuff. OK, does anybody else want to add to to Tristram? Heather? Um, yeah, um, through um, my research, um, I found that students um, from, who, from working class backgrounds um, go to university with the idea of getting a better job. Yeah, um, and, and I think the Delhi speaks to itself. If we take out um, medicine, particularly health sciences, from our uh, Delhi gap, we get a much more pronounced gap because um, those students um, who are the first member of their family who go who to go to university and do get jobs tend to be from that faculty. Um, and we uh, the, the intern who I, I seem to be a little bit obsessed with because she wrote this amazing <laughs> report. And if I could just um, say something that she wrote in the report, which is which just inspires me more than anything I've read in a very long time, and she said. There's a, an expectation of working class students that they should aspire for professional careers, especially if we attend university. This can appear to devalue working class jobs as we are not encouraged to aspire to them. It is a limited portrayal of success. Wow. Thank you, Heather. Laden is coming in next. I'd just really briefly like to add that I think that also the focus um, with pre-entry work um, has always been on sort of raising aspirations uh, for students, but also really pushing them to go into higher education. And I think there's been like almost a myth um, that once you're in HE, there's a level, it's kind of level the playing field, that your the job is done. Uh, and once you're in HE, you then have to just get your grades buckle down and focus and I think also there's probably a bit of kind of um, other external factors that come into play or sort of cultural implications potentially as well um, but I think it's also important to remember that WP students aren't one homogenous group so I think it's like let we we tend to go okay all these these students all have you know lack this or they don't have this or uh, they don't and on balance, yes, it's true that they might not take part in extracurricular activities because of these reasons, um, which is part of why some of the uh, way I target some of my work is around addressing kind of the importance of uh, engaging in other activities uh, outside of your degree, but also valuing what your degree also brings to it as well. Uh, so um, we embed employability into the curriculum uh, for that reason um, as well. Lovely. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, Jamie, in fact, my next question was going to be for you, Jamie. So if you'd like to just respond and then I'll, and I'll ask you, which will be our final question, I think. OK, so I'm, I'm involved in a piece of work at the moment, which is looking at the, the transferable skills I mentioned earlier on. But this is about people that are sort of mid career. So in our um, in our left area, although Heathrow Airport isn't, isn't doesn't actually sit in, in our area, we have thousands of people, particularly in, in the, the Spellthorn um, um, area who are actually employed you know, directly or, or indirectly to, to, to Heathrow. Um, and in fact, we were approached um, by the Creative Industries um, uh, Pinewood Studios um, and Spellthorn and, and uh, Screen Skills um, to do a, a piece of work um, to essentially work with some of those people uh, from the aviation industry that have been sort of displaced um, with a view to looking at the potential that you know the possibility of actually transferring some of their skills into a, another sector in this case creative industries now there is not um, a, a promise of, of jobs but what it does do is it will empower those individuals to take stock of the skills that they have developed in you know in the aviation sector um, and you know, put them in, in a position where actually they can use, use the word articulate again but articulate them to employers in, in perhaps other industries now the aviation sector will pick up uh, at some point um, and, and they will be able to sort of you know, come back in, into the aviation sector. But in the meantime, here's an opportunity to think about transferring those skills to another sector. However, there's a piece of work that needs to be done with the employers as well to be more open to those sorts of approaches from uh, from people um, from from other sectors. And, and again, you know, rather than looking at the you, know, you haven't got the, the knowledge of our, our sector, actually look at the skills because the knowledge can be developed over, over time. Um, you know, if they've got the, the skills that are required, take a good look, get them in the room or <laughs> on a Zoom, Zoom call 
um, and, uh, and, and explore how actually they can transfer their, their skills. There may be some gaps. You can work on that, you know, talk to education training providers to fill those gaps. But um, so, you know, again, that the idea of, of, of thinking about um, undergraduates um, talking to business, hear from business at a very early stage of their university career to think about the skills that they're developing during their course, but outside of their course and how they're going to transfer those into, into lots of different exciting jobs, some of which you know, don't exist right now. Um, and I'm, you know, it's not just the, the technical, the vocational subjects, if you like. At University of Winchester, we've got more sort of the, the liberal arts and um, and some of the, the social sciences, which perhaps don't lend themselves to particular careers, but they've got some fantastic skills that they're developing that will transfer into lots of different sorts of jobs. Okay, I'll stop there. Okay. What's my question? <laughs> Thank you. No, my final question, and, and I suppose um, it was going to be to you initially, Jamie, but. Um, and to the rest of the panel and it's around really um, um, open days, university open days and to potential students and the messages that the careers um, departments will be kind of sharing with uh, potential undergrads around, you know, uh, you know, sort of like employability statistics, uh, etc. So how realistic can we be as uh, careers professionals about um, sending that, sending that, that kind of like that real message, as opposed to the the the, the kind of the, the the corporate speak about coming to our university and the great employability statistics, because there is a little bit of a um, a disconnect, I think, sometimes within that. I don't know. I was going to ask you, Jamie, first because you were, um, you know, sort of like you know, working with working with younger younger people and that those messages. Um, not, I used to be, not not directly anymore. But um, in fact, you know, I I have been involved in in open days um, through WP and actually in careers teams. Um, and you know, initially, when I did open days, we didn't have um, WP, so we didn't have careers teams uh, you know, presenting at, at open days. But that began to to change, um, and I think it, it was welcomed, particularly by sort of parents and, and carers. So. You know, I'd, I'd be interested in breaking that the, the question down a little bit further and sort of saying depends on the audience. Young people are going to have probably slightly different careers questions to actually the, the, the mums and the dads and, and the carers in the room. Um, but it'd be great to, to, to get them involved. Again, if they can bring a, a, a business that has, has, has taken on um, some, some students, some interns, um, then sort of fantastic. Get some, uh, and it, it, it depends depends on the, the sort of institution and you know, it would be again where you've got a course that doesn't necessarily lend itself to particular um, careers. If you can get an employer and that's actually made a successful um, appointment from a, from a student from that course, um, they can talk about it, even bring the, the student back, then then great. Um, again, we go for some local um, uh, local examples, but yeah, with, with, with the joys of video conferencing, actually it could be a national, it could be an international. Um, example. So again, breaking courses down into transferable skills and seeing how they can be um, you know, linked into, connected to the world of work. Okay, uh, we have actually got one final question in. So uh, I don't know whether anybody else wants to comment on that one. Um, and this will definitely be the, the last question. How can we, what can we do, sorry, what can we do to increase the social cultural capital of widening participation students? Should we? Or would we be, or would, or would that be to impose a corrective model of identity and culture? Just a nice, easy last question for the panel on a Tuesday afternoon. Laden, thank you, Laden. Um, so I think there's a, again the balance. So I think the reality is that if there is going to be some barriers that students might face in the world of work that because of their again lack of so I appreciate that again I don't like using language that's kind of in the deficit but let's for this for this, for this sake um, lack of uh, social capital and if that's the reality and I am against kind of polishing students so I'm not suggesting that's what we need to do but it's kind of if the students don't know certain things then I do think that it's important that we uh, try to get help them uh, discover this information how to navigate it um, because I'm Unfortunately, certain things are happening in the workforce, but there's that balance that it's and I hate to think that 
we are saying to students it's all within your hands it's all within your control because really it isn't so yeah to me it's balancing what can a student do uh, to, to succeed in whatever it is that they want to succeed in uh, versus um, the external forces that might be a barrier lovely thank you heather you wanted to uh, point and then um, tristram okay i'll try to be as quick as possible uh, this kind of is my specialist area of interest uh, i think that universities need to cherish WP students. I think the, the employers need to recognise the unique skill set that they have and um, it's not going to happen overnight. There's some great things happening with the social mobility index and projects like Lardens. Um, a lot of really interesting widening participation work happening at the moment as well to support students who enter university to feel a sense of belonging. That's a new word, isn't it? And it's a really fantastic initiative. But I think it's about um, not pointing out difference, but pointing out the unique value and the unique uh, skill set as they move towards the graduate labour market that, that non WP students have less of. Thank you. And Tristram. Oh, you're on mute. You're on mute. So, sorry, sorry. Yeah, uh, somebody had to do it at some point. It's usually, <laughs> usually me. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think, um, I mean, really echo what, what, what the last two people said but it's I think we have to be really yeah really careful with this um, and I suppose what I've what, why I've talked about this idea of sort of critical consciousness and building critical consciousness is is it moves us away from just saying oh well you know you've got to learn you've got to learn about the opera and about cricket because that's you know that's what that's what the you know the masters like and so we've all got to just learn all these things it's like i don't care about the opera i don't care about cricket i'm not interested in these things so why should i learn them like i should be critical now all right i might i might make the choice that i need to learn enough of these things in order to to be able to get over an immediate hurdle but i should do that with a critical edge to what i'm doing i should think about why is it that i'm being expected to do that why is it i'm being expected to learn things which are not fundamentally better than the things i i value they're just they're ways in which a particular class and group of people manage to organize and keep power to themselves so I, that's why I think it's not just a question of like so some of the schemes that I've seen of, that try to do this is like oh we'll take working class kids to the opera and get them to love the opera and it's I just think that that misses the point of how what's actually going on really and and so keep that I think we need to keep the critical edge when when we're we're talking about these things with people and then obviously people will make the, their decisions for themselves about how they want to navigate that. Thank you. Um, that was, I think, an excellent question to end our um, uh, webinar and thank you for excellent um, responses as well. Um, so yes, uh, we're at the end. Um, who knew that it would last this long and it has. Um, I have to say again, I'm really, really um, delighted to have, have met um, all of the presenters today and have really enjoyed um, uh, and respected the work that you have all done um, in getting this presentation um, together. Um, throughout the, 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 the question and answer, you know, we had a lot of responses saying how excellent the presentations were and how interesting this, this webinar has been. So um, that is obviously for the, um, the presenters um, um, to be celebrated, but also for the questions that the, that the, the participants that you, as, you have um, asked um, the panel. Um, this is going to be recorded and this will be shared on the FACE website um, and also we can we can share the presentations as well. Um, I'm pretty certain all of our panellists will, will agree to that. So really, um, I would just like again to really thank Heather, Jamie, uh, Larden and Tristram for an excellent um, webinar. Um, and um, I think really the, the discussion um, and the challenges um, continue and I think um, this is really um, if it's not the beginning it's certainly not the end um, and I would like you all to go back to your institutions um, and and have these discussions so thank you very much thanks a lot bye-bye <laughs>